The other day, my friend was saying they had an existential crisis. What does that even mean? Well, actually, there's a lot more to existentialism than just the colloquial saying, existential crisis. Let's get into it. Okay, we're going to begin by defining some terms of existentialism. The first two are transcendence and facticity. As Thomas Flynn explains in his text, Existentialism, a very brief in introduction, facticity denotes the givens of our situations, such as our race and nationality, our talents and limitations, the others with whom we deal, as well as our previous choices. Transcendence, or the reach that our consciousness extends beyond these givens, denotes the takings of our situation, namely how we face up to this facticity. The next three terms we will define are authentic, inauthentic, and bad faith. Someone who accepts their, their ability to transcend their facticity is authentic. To deny responsibility for our situation is to be inauthentic. A common expression of this inauthenticity is bad faith, which is a way of defining any action of self-deception. Lastly, we will define alienation, which is the separation in the relation of an individual from that to which he or she is relating. Period. In A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams, Blanche Dubois represents this inauthentic person, considering that she actively ignores her ability to overcome her dissatisfaction with her givens. These givens would include her age, appearance, socioeconomic status, and greed. Instead, she acts in bad faith or self-deception, claiming that she cannot change her situation, eventually leading to an unfulfilling life. This idea can be broken down into a simple chart. In order for inauthenticity and bad faith to occur, Blanche has to be fully aware that she's making the choice to deceive herself and realize that she can change her situation, but chooses not to. Ultimately, this bad faith and inauthenticity will lead to her unfulfillment. Beginning with her age, Blanche realizes that she is not as young as she once was. So she tries to avoid this given in her life by constantly cleansing herself, believing it will increase her youthfulness. This youthfulness is so important to her because she believes it is the only thing that will allow her to win the affection of Stanley's friend Mitch. She washes away her age and ideals, hoping that love and companionship from Mitch will renew her. Blanche explains that she wants to deceive him enough to make him want her. This idea of purposeful deception denies her ability to accept her facticity. It also reiterates her conscious choice to knowingly cleanse herself and her awareness to change her current situation. On the other hand, it shows how she is aware of her own deception that Mitch has to love her. This is not necessarily true considering Mitch never explicitly says that she must be young and desirable in order to receive his affection. In the end, however, the lies and deception, not her age, that Blanche tells to Mitch leads to their breakup and her dissatisfaction with her situation. Once again, Blanche tries to hide the facticity of her appearance with dim lighting and complete darkness. She knowingly and willingly dims the lights as she enters a room, giving the free will and conscious choice to choose how her situation will end. This brings in the bad faith that she must be beautiful in order for people to hang out with her, a deception she constantly tries to avoid. In one of these instances, she says that she can't stand a naked, naked light bulb. Just as Blanche covers the naked light bulb, she also covers her true appearance. As is true with darkness, the darker it gets, the harder it is to find something. For Blanche, that something is the truth. Ultimately, this br brings Blanche unfulfillment, since her inauthentic life of denying the facticity of her appearance contributes to the lies she tells Stella and Stanley. These lies eventually leave her alone in mental institution at the end of the play. In relation to her socioeconomic status, Blanche tries to change her givens of previously losing her childhood home in Laurel, called Belle Reeve. She must give up Belle Reeve to protect her status as a proper lady of society, in the sense that she is seen as a virtuous schoolteacher of Laurel. However, this status soon disappears as the townsfolk notice her impropriety with her students. This immoral behavior leads her to flee Laurel in search for a place that does not know her infamy. She even says, I don't want realism, I want magic. I don't tell truth, I tell what ought to be truth. This confession proves her conscious choice of leaving Laurel in search of New Orleans. The realism involved is actually losing Belle Reeve and staying to deal with the aftermath, whereas the magic is moving to another place to continue to lie and forget all about it. In the end, she loses this magic she once had in Laurel in both the literal loss of Belle Reeve and the realization of her impropriety in Laurel. Once more is her self-deception evident when she portrays a former lover, Shep Huntley, as in dire search of her. Shep Huntley is a very rich man, so by falsifying his search for her, Blanche elevates her own social status as someone of high importance. This part of her socioeconomic status leaves her unfulfilled when Stanley discovers Huntley is not searching for her. Thus, her social status once again declines. After her husband, Alan, commits suicide, Blanche deals with her facticity of her grief by using bad faith to deceive herself into believing that she cannot exist alone and therefore must engage in the immediate gratification of sexual promiscuity. 
From the beginning of the play, Blanche states that she must be with somebody. She can't be alone, highlighting her aversion to solidarity and also the conscious recognition for human contact. As a result, she engages in affairs with students and town folk back in Laurel, which emphasizes her dependence on relationships to reconcile her grief. Eventually, this impropriety is discovered when Stanley explains that she was regarded not just as different, but downright loco nuts. This label led to her lack of stability, only further supporting her need for sexual gratification. Almost immediately after speaking with Stanley, Blanche states, That man is my executioner. That man will destroy me. By explaining that Stanley's going to destroy her, she's foreshadowing the execution of her sanity, and thus her lack of fulfillment, due to unrestrained desire. Her fornications grant her short-term happiness, while they also force her to face long-term instability of the mind. Proving herself the opposite of an existentialist, Blanche Dubois refuses to define her own existence through authentic actions. Instead, she relies on bad faith to cope with the givens of her situation. Because Blanche avoids making authentic choices, she cannot experience her fundamental freedom, which is the ultimate attainment of consciousness. It is for this reason that Blanche's reliance on bad faith to avoid transcending her facticity causes her to live a dissatisfied and unfulfilling life. Existentialism can be used to analyze the life of Snoopy, one of America's favorite comic characters. As we all know, Snoopy is a dog who lives in the primarily human society of the Peanuts comic strip, and he cannot change this given. Because he is a dog, he spends the majority of his life in Charlie Brown's backyard. He is lonely and bored because he does not have many opportunities to leave the backyard. In addition to being incredibly bored, Snoopy is also alienated from his peers due to a language barrier. Snoopy is never depicted as having the ability to speak. His only form of expression is shown in thought bubbles. Therefore, it is assumed that Snoopy is not able to talk to the humans he is surrounded by. Furthermore, he cannot carry a conversation with his best friend Woodstock. Woodstock is a bird who can only speak in his bird language. Not only is Snoopy separated from all of the humans he is seen with, he can't even communicate with his fellow non-human friends. This leaves Snoopy isolated in addition to being bored. Because Snoopy is alienated and bored, he loses himself in multiple fake personas. These personas typically involve Snoopy pretending to hold occupations held by humans, which shows Snoopy's desire to be connected with the people around him. Also, these positions are usually described as world famous or great, which shows that he wants to have a more important role in his daily life. Since Snoopy chooses to pretend to be something that he is not, he is inauthentic. In addition to his personas, he even allows his proximity to humans to determine his identity. For example, when he is dressed up as a lawyer, one of his many personas, he is seen as a human dressed as a dog when he's seated by Linus, but as a dog dressed as a human when he's on his own. According to existentialism, one who is inauthentic cannot possibly live a satisfying life. Since Snoopy does not accept his ability to move beyond his situation of being a dog in a primarily human society and instead creates fake lives for himself, he is inauthentic and therefore unfulfilled. To take a step back and look at the big picture, let's go back and define the philosophy of existentialism. Existentialism is the idea that humans define their own meaning by embracing existence and exercising personal freedom and choice within an inherently meaningless life. The main phrase of the philosophy is that existence precedes essence, which essentially just means that the act of existing in the world comes before your essence or whatever meaning or value that your life can possess. As Sartre puts it in his text, Existentialism is a Humanism, it means, first of all, man exists, turns up, appears on the scene, and only afterwards defines himself. If man, as the existentialist conceives him, is indefinable, it is because at first he is nothing. Only afterward will he be something, and he himself will have made what he will be. Existentialists believe that we have certain givens in our life, such as our sex, race, nationality, socioeconomic status, etc but that these givens do not define us. We are defined by our choices and actions. Again, Sartre explains that man is therefore nothing else than the ensemble of his acts, nothing else than his life. An authentic person, according to existentialists, is anyone who accepts their freedom of choice rather than allowing themselves to be defined by other factors. All in all, existentialism is important because it teaches us that it is possible to create meaning in a meaningless world, and through doing that, one is authentic and ultimately fulfilled. Hey, have y'all ever thought about how existentialism applies to your own lives? Yeah, actually. Really? We should tell some stories about that. For yeah. sure. Yeah. So whenever I was in kindergarten, we were learning about the civil rights movement. While teaching the basics, my, ki my kindergarten teacher said, Martha Luther King Jr. was black, just like Alyssa. 
No, I just pretended that I knew what she was talking about because I like to think that I was smart, but I had no idea what she was talking about. The only thing I related black to was the color found in my crayon box, not my skin color. Whenever I got home, I asked my mom if I was, in fact, black, and she responded, you're not black, you're mixed. And this just made me even more confused, especially as a five-year-old. And this is the day that I realized that I was very, very different from all the kids around me, and it wasn't just my character. This began my identity crisis that I still find myself struggling with to this day. After learning about existentialism, I realized that my skin color was just a facticity, something that I was given. And I do not have to let this given define who I am. During my sophomore year, I experienced somewhat of an awakening. I hit a point in my life where I was first starting to question things that I had always held to be true, and I was questioning all of it all at once. My main area of focus was my religious beliefs. After being raised a Catholic, surrounded by religious people, and taught Catholicism my whole life, my faith in God and adherence to the Catholic religion had become assumed rather than actually believed. Because I allowed myself to be influenced by those around me, rather than choosing for myself what I believed and which religion I wanted to belong to, I was living an inauthentic existence. Soon enough, junior year came and it was time for the Sacrament of Confirmation. I went through the process required to become confirmed, but in the end, I opted to not be confirmed in the Catholic faith because it didn't feel like the right decision for me at the time. I didn't know it then, but I was actually using the tenets of existentialism in this situation. I accepted my ability to transcend the facticity that was my religion and use my freedom of choice to decide for myself how I wanted to be defined. Every year, the CHS band competes at Showcase, which is basically the state competition for high school bands. Our first year, we received third place. Then sophomore year, we placed fifth. Then the next year, we got sixth. And then last year, we ended up getting 13th. But a lot of seniors were upset about this because considering it's our last year and naturally we wanted to make it the best. Unfortunately, I think the basis of this downfall was a form of bad faith. We've always been told that we were a very well-known band. Whenever we have master classes with professors from around the state, they always praise us for being the best behaved and easiest to teach and wonderful to listen to. They truly honestly believe that we are one of the best bands in the state. Naturally, we didn't always think that we had the best practices, and whenever these bad practices happen, as they happen every year, our band director, Mr. Messina, would constantly remind us of that greatness, the greatness that professionals and mentors saw in us. Usually this helped us to remember to do our best and fix just one thing that was wrong with each rep, but this reminder was just a reminder. We have to act on it to make that greatness actually happen. Just because he was telling us that we were good and truly one of the best bands in the state doesn't mean that we would still be that year. Everyone bought onto this idea of believing that there would be no way that we would not make top 10. Another thing that Mr. Messina swore would never happen, even with all of our bad practices. I thought it wouldn't happen either, so there was no way that we would possibly get below top 10. But in relation to existentialism, Mr. Messina reminding us of how good we are without actively trying to continue to do so is a form of bad faith. We were aware, as we were in our previous higher ranking years, that we have to work to make ourselves better, but we unfortunately listen to those reminders rather than making them real expectations we set for ourselves, hence the lower placement. In the fall, I plan on joining Tiger Band, a nationally known band set for their skill and talent. There are actually three auditions that I have to pass in order to be considered a member of Tiger Band. I've already passed the first one, but it's a little scary knowing that I'm not even the best clarinet player in the CHS band. So naturally, I thought, why would I be accepted into such a selective band program? Breaking that thought down is actually a way I surpass bad faith. If I let that thought manifest and influence my decision, then I would never have passed the first audition. Additionally, if I am accepted into the program, I can't assume that I am a good player. I have to constantly practice and keep up my skills in order to remain a good player. I was exposed to bad faith this year in the CHS band program, and I'm already using the tenets of existentialism to avoid making that mistake in the future. I've avoided unfulfillment due to bad faith by auditioning, and I will once again avoid bad faith by continuing to practice, even if I'm still told how good I am without doing so. At the beginning of my junior year at SJA, my parents began telling rather than asking about potential college and degree options that I would most definitely decide upon. I mean, I didn't really know much about college. 
I just knew I was expected to go. My parents had their own idea of my future. I would go to a Texas school and major in chemical engineering. And only as of about two months ago, that was what I was going to do. After being accepted into different universities that offered me a variety of incredible opportunities, I began to question what it was that I wanted for myself, not what I had been told. What if I didn't want to be a chemical engineer? What if I didn't even want to be an engineer? That could change or even take away opportunities that have been granted to me. Once I started looking into each school more in depth, I realized that maybe I was trying to follow a path my parents made for me. That's when I decided to take it upon myself to research university programs and even jobs that would be available to me. It was almost as if a light bulb went off. I soon gained awareness of what I was meant to do, and it was in fact to be an engineer, but I was not meant to go to school where I thought I was. Self-awareness essentially makes one authentic, and I didn't know that my feelings of doubt were existential situations, but now I realize that I set out to define myself and make decisions for myself. And I am ultimately a happier person now that I have chosen my path for myself.